Welcome to CMI TV's Time for Biblical Q&A. In this video series, Dr. Robert Congdon, Director of Congdon Ministries International, will offer biblical answers to the questions you send him via email. Questions may be sent to questions at congdonministries.org. Dr. Congdon will answer each question by applying the Biblicist method of Bible study. This means that his answers will be based upon a literal, normal, historical, and grammatical interpretation of the scriptures. Where appropriate, he will explain why the Biblicist's approach to Bible interpretation offers a more accurate answer to questions than the Reformed Calvinist's approach that is being applied and widely propagated by many in churches today. Here is a question submitted by a viewer of our most recent program. After watching your CMI TV program on the Great White Throne Judgment, I wondered if the sheep and goat judgment we read of in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, takes place during the events of the Great White Throne Judgment. Are they both a part of the same event as many Calvinists teach? Thank you. And now to Dr. Congdon's response. Thank you for submitting this excellent question. For the sheep and goats judgment is often misunderstood and misrepresented. There are two major interpretations and understanding of this passage among Christendom. The first is held by those of the Reformed Calvinist view and is very prevalent within Christian circles today. The second is the Biblicist dispensational view that is held by a smaller group. Now, besides these two groups, the common view held by many unbelievers and false religions is that heaven or hell for each individual will be determined by a final judgment where good and bad deeds are weighed in a balance. If the good outweighs the bad, then heaven is the reward. If the bad outweighs the good, hell is the punishment. However, Proverbs 14.12 tells us that there's a way which seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof are the ways of death. The Bible clearly tells us that heaven or hell is not determined this way, for it says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, God's gracious gift of salvation and heaven are through faith in the substitutionary death of his son on the cross. There God judged the sinless Son of God as he bore the sins of all humanity on our behalf. Both Biblicist dispensationalists and Reformed Calvinists share this concept of salvation. They differ significantly, however, when it comes to the means that God uses to draw individuals to salvation. I have covered this thoroughly in my video series on the tumbling of Calvin's tulip and eschatology. Now, keeping this in mind, let us begin by looking into the Reformed Calvinist view. We'll now look at the Calvinist teaching of Matthew 25. The Calvinist sees the sheep and goats judgment as an expanded description of the events associated with the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20. Key to this teaching is their belief that all humanity that's saved and unsaved must appear before God on judgment day that immediately follows Christ's second coming at the end of the world. Calvinists believe that the sheep are those individuals whom God elected or chose in eternity past to be with him in heaven forever. The goats, on the other hand, are those whom God did not choose. Therefore, by default, God intended them to go to hell. To the Calvinist, Matthew 25 merely pictures the separating of these two groups at the great white throne judgment. They base this distinction not on the individual's works, but on God's prior election before the foundation of the world. For the sheep, their works serve as evidence confirming they have been elected to heaven. To a large degree, Calvinists must view judgment in this way 
in order to support the P of TULIP, that's their doctrine of perseverance. This Calvinistic doctrine, perseverance, teaches that one must continue doing good works faithfully throughout life in order to provide sufficient evidence confirming they are the elect. Hence, they must persevere to the end, if indeed they are genuinely elect. Catch that? It is they who must do the persevering, not God. This means that if a Calvinist backslides or has a dry time in his or her spiritual life, this might indicate that he or she is not part of the elect. Sadly, this creates anxiety, insecurity, and fear among those who hold to this teaching, for they realize they cannot know their eternal destiny with certainty until after their death. Individuals who hold to this teaching on perseverance must continually assure themselves by good works that they are of the elect and eternally secure. According to the Bible, however, God is the one who preserves the believer and keeps him or her secure. For Jude tells us in verses 1 and 4, states this, Jude, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Catch that? Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. We also look at 1 John 5.13. It assures all of us who have truly trusted Christ for salvation that we are eternally secure. For John tells us, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know, and that word know means with certainty, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. We can only conclude that the Calvinist belief that the individual must keep on gathering evidence throughout life in order to prove his or her election as a sheep at the great white throne judgment. But this does not agree with the word of God. Those who hold to this false doctrine do not have assurance of their salvation, and consequently, many serve the Lord out of fear instead of love. Works that are motivated by fear would be considered to be dead or useless works by the Lord. Let us now look at the Biblicist dispensational view. That is, that the sheep and goat's judgment is a separate event that will occur 1,000 years before the great white throne judgment. In doing this study, we will see once again that Calvin's eschatology tumbles when we carefully compare it with the scriptures. Having considered the Calvinist view of Matthew 25, the sheep and the goat's judgment, we'll now look at the Biblicist dispensational view. Please turn to Matthew chapter 25. Let's read verses 31 to 46. Matthew 25, beginning at verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, 
inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. To study this passage, we find the five W's, investigative and research method, extremely helpful. This method is used by researchers, lawyers, law enforcement personnel, the media, and of course Bible students. The five W's are who, what, when, where, and why. By applying these five questions to our passage, we'll gain a true understanding of the sheep and goat's judgment. We're going to start with the who of the five W's. In this passage, there are three primary who's that must be identified and understood before we can answer the remaining W's of our study. The three are, who is the Son of Man? He's also called the King and the Lord in verses 31, 34, 40, and 44. The second who to be identified are the brethren of verse 40. The third who to be identified are the nations of verse 32. Now, we don't need to identify the Father or the angels, for most Bible scholars agree the Father is God the Father, and the holy angels, verse 31, are those who did not follow Satan as fallen angels. Therefore, we're going to look at the terms that have been debated by Bible students. These three terms, the Son of Man, Brother, and Nation, need to be considered carefully. The Son of Man is used 193 times in our Bible. The majority of usages do not indicate a physical birth relationship, but instead describe someone's nature. Thus, Son of Man is used to indicate Christ's humanity the human aspect of his total nature. In the New Testament, we find this identification most frequently used by Matthew, and over half of his usage is in the context of the Olivet Discourse. Now, in the Jewish culture of Jesus' day, Son of Man was the most important title given to the Messiah, and the average Jewish person knew it was always a reference to the coming Messiah. Throughout the Olivet Discourse, Matthew uses this term to link the coming messianic kingdom with its king who would rule from David's throne in Jerusalem. Now God first indicated this to David in a promise to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, where God says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Those who first heard the Olivet Discourse would have identified Jesus of Nazareth as the very Son of Man, and would have understood that he was speaking of his return as Messiah. King and Lord. The association of this title and position was reinforced by Jesus himself when he declared his unique relationship to God as my Father. No Jewish man would ever say my Father, but rather would use the term our Father. For such a declaration to say my Father would have been blasphemous to the Jewish people of that day, unless 
Of course, Jesus was truly God's Son. Notice that the hearers of the discourse did not call it blasphemous, for they recognized Jesus was truly the Son of Man. For these reasons, we conclude that the Son of Man, the King, and the Lord in this passage all refer to the Lord Jesus Christ in his future position as King of the Messianic Kingdom. We're now ready to look at the second term, my brethren. Identification of this next group, the brethren of verse 40, is directly linked to the use of the term son of man. You see, the word brethren can be used of relatives, but it can also be ethnic associations or spiritually connected people. Since the first hearers of this message did not include Jesus' family members, we can rule out the relative aspect of the term brethren. That leaves us with the possibility that he was referring to the disciples who were present with him at the time, or he could have been referring to his spiritual and ethnic association with Israel according to the flesh. If he was speaking to the disciples right in front of him, he would have simply said, You, my brothers. But he didn't. Furthermore, no one questioned who he was referring to, for the normal understanding of the day would have been his fellow Jews, the brethren. This is further substantiated in his answer to the three questions that was asked by his disciples back in chapter 24 of verse 3. They ask the following. Number one, when shall these things be? Number two, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Now the word coming was always used to indicate the advent of the Jewish Messiah. And the third, what shall be the sign of the end of the world? Now, that should be better translated age. Thus, their third question was, what shall be the sign of the end of the age? You see, the rabbinical teaching of the day was that there were three ages, the present age, the messianic kingdom age, and then the eternal age. Since these questions relate directly to the nation of Israel, its people, its anticipated kingdom, its future, all of which are the prime focus of Matthew's gospel, we must conclude that the brethren are Jesus' people, the Jewish people. Therefore, the term Son of Man brings out Jesus' humanity and his role as Messiah. The Lord's answers to the disciples' three questions, covered in Matthew 24 and 25, establish his discussion to be within the context of Israel, the Jewish people, and the coming Messianic kingdom. Now, accepting this definition of brethren, we are ready to define the nations and its context with respect to the Jewish people. In reading through this passage in Matthew, we first notice that the nations are evaluated in terms of their good or bad behavior toward others. Secondly, we notice that the nations are distinctly separate from the brethren, who we've already identified as the Jewish people. Third, a survey of the Bible reveals to us the word nations, or ethnos in Greek, is found 164 times in the New Testament. There it is translated as people twice, heathen five times, nation 64 times, and Gentile 93 times. A careful analysis of the 93 majority passages discloses that the nation is used as a technical term for the Gentiles as distinct from the Jews. Fourth, during Christ's time on earth, the common use of the term nations would have been understood by the Jewish audience as a reference to the Gentiles that is, anyone who was not Jewish. Bible teacher William Kelly's study finds that, and I quote, those gathered are all the nations, a term never used about the dead or the risen, in other words, those resurrected for judgment, but only applied to men here below 
and indeed applied to the Gentiles as distinct from the Jews. End quote. Finally, the context of this Olivet Discourse is an obvious reference to the Jewish people who would be living during the time of the abomination of desolation. This phrase that Matthew uses in verse 15, he is quoted from Daniel. Now, for Matthew's original readers, this link to Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 immediately told the Jewish people that he was speaking about the seven-year tribulation that will take place just prior to the messianic age that the prophet Daniel described back in Daniel 9. Therefore, we conclude with all of these reasons that the nations of Matthew 25, 32 includes all Gentile people that are alive and have come through the tribulation. Thus, we conclude that the three who's are identified. Now that we've answered our three who's, let's answer the what question. The what question of our passage is an analysis of the passage's purpose. This is determined by examining the events described in verse 32 of Matthew 25, where we read, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Since we know that nations refers to the Gentiles who have survived the tribulation, we also know that these are the people that will be divided into two distinct groups, uh, labeled the sheep and the goats. As I showed in my CMI TV program on the Great White Throne Judgment, the outcome of a biblical judgment is always some form of separation for those who are judged, just as we see in this passage. As part of the what, we need to better understand the two groups in this judgment. There are two key aspects in verse 37 that will help us to define who the sheep are. The first key aspect, they are blessed, says Christ, of his Father. In John chapter 10, we have a similar situation. Verses 27 through 29, Christ responds to the rejection of the Jewish leadership by saying that his sheep, and he suggests both Jewish and Gentiles here, that his sheep hear his voice and follow him. This is the same picture used of true believers that follow him and will enter into his kingdom, for he is their shepherd and they are his sheep. In this passage, the sheep, they can't be the church age saints, for they were raptured and glorified before the tribulation. Of the church age saints, we read that according to the scriptures, they're already blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Therefore, they have already been blessed. So these sheep of this passage in Matthew 25, they come into the kingdom and become blessed. So we have the church saints are already blessed with all spiritual blessings. This group is clearly a group going to receive a blessing. Furthermore, if we look in Psalm 24, verses 3 through 5, it speaks of those entering the coming kingdom, and they will then, as they enter the kingdom, receive a blessing. The second key aspect, they are to inherit the kingdom. As we've shown earlier, the kingdom is the messianic kingdom where Jesus Christ will reign as king. This throws us back to Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, for it tells us here that the Son of Man will be given, and I'm quoting the verse 13, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages shall serve him. You see that? It's all people, nations, languages. So that includes Gentiles. It goes on to tell us, his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. 
When we look over in Zechariah 14, verse 9, another prophetic passage about this coming kingdom, it tells us that the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Clearly, all the earth includes the Gentiles. Thus, these two biblical references clearly demonstrate that the worldwide universal aspect of the future kingdom of the Messiah will include Gentiles. Therefore, I conclude that the answer to the what, or the purpose of this passage, is to explain and describe the separating of the peoples of the nation into two groups, each with an eternal destination, the righteous into the Messianic kingdom of Christ as his sheep following him as the shepherd, and the unrighteous into everlasting fire apart from God. We need also to note that Calvinists and Biblicists agree that the sheep and goats separation occurs at the second coming of Christ, but they differ significantly over what follows that separation. Thus, it is crucial to study the when of our passage carefully in order to understand all that God is doing at this time. As I have already noted, chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew relate a series of events that is in answer to the disciples' question, when shall these things be? The answer the Lord gave them is significant, for it reveals that the sheep and goats' judgment cannot be part of the great white throne judgment. Beginning in verse 4 and continuing to verse 35 of Matthew 24, the Lord answers the disciples' question of when, for Jesus Christ then proceeds to list several signs that will precede his second coming. He says that false Christs will arise. Wars, natural disasters, false prophets, as well as the preaching of the gospel throughout the entire world will be occurring prior to this time. Further, Daniel prophesied that the temple would be desecrated by the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation, in the midst of the seven-year tribulation. Now, Matthew recorded Christ's warning about this abomination of desolation, and he adds the admonition, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Thus, God wants Matthew's readers to study Daniel so that they can understand this discourse. To ignore Daniel and his prophecy will only cause people to misunderstand Matthew 24 and 25. Now, most Calvinists do not study books of prophecy such as Daniel. I was told by one Calvinistic pastor that with respect to prophecy, he follows the words of Daniel in chapter 12, verses 8 and 9 which read, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Because it says the words are closed and sealed till the end of time, that pastor believed that we can't understand them. Therefore, don't even try. I believe, however, that we can understand much more during the church age, the last age before Christ's return. For much has been revealed to us in the New Testament that Daniel did not know. I strongly disagree with this pastor, and I note Matthew's reference to Daniel 9.27, which reads, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, dispensationalists teach that the midst of the week in this passage is the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. 
Thus, in verse 16 of Matthew, Christ is speaking to the Jewish people who will be living in Judea during this future time of the tribulation. He warns them when they see the abomination of desolation, they are to flee to the mountains. As we move on to verses 29 and 30, the Lord tells them that immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, as we move into chapter 25, after relating parables warning them to watch for Jesus Christ's second coming, Matthew then goes on to tell us Christ will sit on his throne and begin the judgment of the sheep and the goats. So in Matthew 25, 31, we read, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. From this, we can clearly conclude that the when of the sheep and goat judgment will occur immediately following the tribulation when Christ returns to earth to set up his kingdom. Now, while Calvinists and Biblicists agree that sheep and goats' judgment occurs at Christ's second coming, where they disagree is about the seven-year tribulation and the millennial reign of Christ. Most Calvinists do not believe there will be a seven-year tribulation, nor do they believe in Christ's millennial reign for a thousand years on the earth. They believe that Jesus Christ will simply return, the sheep and goats and the great white throne judgment will then take place, and the eternal kingdom will commence. They keep it very simple. Many Calvinists view the tribulation as an allegory. They say it pictures general trials and tribulations that have occurred all through history, not a specific seven-year period of time. Biblicists believe that the sheep and goats judgment takes place right after the seven-year tribulation. Then begins Jesus Christ's millennial, thousand-year messianic kingdom on earth. At the end of that thousand years, the great white throne judgment will take place. As we will soon discover, this division is significant, this division between Calvinists and Biblicists. The two different views of this prophetic end times are crucial to understanding God's entire plan for history. Therefore, determining where the sheep and goats judgment will take place will help us to decide which view is correct, the Biblicist or the Calvinist, with respect to both end time events and with respect to the sheep and goats judgment, and is it or is it not part of the great white throne judgment? Where the separation of the sheep and goats takes place reveals significant differences between the Reformed Calvinist teaching and the Biblicist dispensational teaching. According to the Calvinist, the sheep and goats judgment as part of the great white throne judgment will take place in heaven or some undefined place. They base this teaching on Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 and 12 where we read, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. Now, since the earth has fled away, the Calvinists call this the end of the world, and quickly 
pass over the location of the event. But at this point, we need to look at what this teaching really would require. It requires a Calvinistic timing of eschatological events that is centered about the second coming of Christ. You see, the Calvinists combine several scripture passages into a single event. These passages include 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, Matthew 24, 30 to 31, Matthew 25, 31 to 46, Revelation 19, 11, Revelation 20, 11 through 15, and Revelation chapter 21. Now, in order to combine all these together, they teach the following sequential events. Jesus Christ will call those who are his to meet him in the air. That's the Thessalonian passage. And immediately they join with him and return back to the earth while the angels gather all unsaved living as well as the dead of all ages in a general resurrection, the Matthew 24 passage. Then the earth is burned up, and the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20 is combined with the sheep and goats judgment of Matthew 25. The separated elect join God in the new heaven and earth, and eternity begins. Revelation 21. Now, this view simplifies end-time events significantly, but it ignores two major biblical teachings we see in prophecy. It ignores the Messianic kingdom and the promised reign of the Messiah upon David's throne in Jerusalem, both of which the Bible indicates are upon the earth. The Messianic Kingdom is proclaimed throughout the Old Testament scriptures, and it continues on to be proclaimed in the Gospel of Matthew, culminates in Revelation chapter 20. It is here that the thousand-year period, the kingdom, is defined in terms of time, and this is the first time the specific length of the time of the kingdom is noted. It also significantly is repeated three times as being 1,000 years. Calvinists interpret the thousand years allegorically. That means that they believe it represents an undefined length of time for the church age. In other words, God is allegorically saying a thousand years, meaning, oh, it's some time during the church age for the length of that church age, whatever the church age length turns out to be. But biblicists view this as a specific time in the normal sense. In other words, they take it literally as meaning precisely 1,000 years. They also believe that the prophets, Matthew's gospel, and John's book of Revelation locate Jesus Christ's messianic reign on this present earth in Jerusalem, where he is seated upon King David's throne in fulfillment of God's promise in what we call the Davidic Covenant of 2 Samuel chapter 7. But Calvinists believe that Jesus Christ has been ruling from King David's throne located in heaven since Jesus Christ ascended from the earth. This last difference between Calvinists and Biblicists can be resolved by looking at what the Bible says about Christ's role during the church age as well as where is he seated at this present time. In the book of Hebrews, we read that Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Now, any concordance will give you a list of verses that refer to Christ being seated at the right hand of God the Father, or at the right hand of the throne of God. But none of these verses state that he is seated as a ruling king on his own or even David's throne. Rather, in Acts chapter 5, verse 31, Jesus Christ is called a prince and a savior, not a king, while he is seated in that passage 
at God's right hand. According to Romans 8, verse 34, and Hebrews in several verses, his role is that of the great high priest as he intercedes for believers during the church age. Significantly now, during the days of Matthew, we learned that a king could authorize individuals to be seated to his either left or his right hand as a position of honor and authority. We see this in Matthew 20, verses 21 to 23, where we read that the mother of James and John asked Jesus to give these positions to her two sons. Obviously, they must have believed that Jesus, as Messiah, was going to sit on a real, physical throne, and they would have understand that throne as the throne of David. You see, this understanding goes way back to the angel's proclamation to Mary at Christ's conception, found in Luke chapter 1, verses 31 to 32, where we read, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. This truth is reinforced in Matthew 25, where we read that he will be seated on his throne of glory at his second coming. The Gospels present Christ, the Messiah, as the King of Israel upon King David's throne because he would be a descendant of David. Only when we get to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1 do we read of another throne for Christ. There it's called the Lamb's throne. We read, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. This is the throne Christ will sit on in the new Jerusalem on the new earth that will be created after the great white throne judgment that we read of in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Careful study of this verse's grammar clearly indicates that there will be two thrones, God the Father's throne and God the Son's throne. So really this verse should be translated if it's going to reflect the grammar of the words, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the throne of the Lamb. God promised David that his descendants would sit as king on a throne in Jerusalem for all eternity. David and the Jewish people have always understood this to mean that David's descendant would rule from a literal throne in the actual city of Jerusalem. I believe our passage settles the issue between Calvinists and Biblicists about the throne, for verse 31 in Matthew 25 contains a significant when then clause. It says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. We need to understand and acknowledge that the triune Godhead has always been ruling over the entire creation since its beginning. In this sense, Jesus Christ, as the second person of the Trinity, is co-ruling, but the throne of the Messiah will be exclusively Christ's throne during the millennial age on this present earth, and the throne of the Lamb will be for all eternity on the new earth. This understanding leads to the conclusion that the sheep and goats judgment will take place on this present earth immediately following Christ's second coming. This brings us to the why. Why must there be this judgment? We've already seen that the sheep and goats judgment is only for Gentiles who survive the tribulation. For the Jewish people will already have been judged. For Ezekiel 20 verses 33 to 38 informs us that the tribulation is a judgment for them where God says, I will bring you into the wilderness of the people 
and there will I plead with you face to face, and I will cause you to pass under the rod, I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge out from among you the rebels, and them, that's the Gentiles, that transgress against me, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Perhaps thinking of this passage in Ezekiel, Matthew writes in chapter 25, verse 16, that the Jewish individuals who flee to the wilderness will have obeyed God and come to know him. For Zechariah 12, 13 tells us that they shall look upon me, that's Jesus Christ, whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. See, God will open a fountain of cleansing to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Jewish people, for sin and for uncleanness. At the end of the tribulation, these righteous Jews will enter directly into the Messianic kingdom. At that point, God will turn to the Gentiles and through a separation process or judgment, distinguish between those Gentiles who are the righteous sheep from those who are the unrighteous goats. The purpose of the sheep and goat judgment is to prevent the unrighteous Gentiles from entering the earthly messianic or millennial kingdom that is about to begin. You see, there is no resurrection at this time, for all living at the end of the tribulation potentially could go right on living into the kingdom. The only entry qualification is that those entering must be righteous through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The denial of the unrighteous goats into the kingdom is the just punishment for those who demonstrated by their ill treatment of Israel during the tribulation that they should be denied entry. For they were warned back in Genesis 12, 3, we read, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. By contrast, the righteous Gentiles through their attitudes and acts of kindness toward the Jewish people during the tribulation. They demonstrate the genuineness of their righteousness as a qualification for entry into the kingdom. Therefore, this judgment only concerns one's entry into the earthly messianic kingdom and does not determine their eternal state. For that state is based solely upon faith in Christ's atoning work on the cross. It is at the great white throne judgment that the goats of the tribulation, along with all other unsaved of history, will bring to light the outward sinful actions and thoughts of individuals that reflect or are reflecting their personal rejection of Christ's offer of salvation throughout their lifetime. Thus, the sheep and goats judgment criteria is based upon works against Jesus' brethren during the tribulation and relates only to the entry into the millennial kingdom. On the other hand, the great white throne judgment criteria is based upon one's personal rejection of Jesus Christ and his gift of salvation and relates to eternal separation from God. Because the sheep and goats judgment and the great white throne judgment are based upon two different criterion and two different outcomes, they cannot be the same event. Furthermore, we learn from the Bible that they are actually separated by a thousand years. Please join me now for some final thoughts. Now that we've completed our investigation, reached a conclusion, I'd like to close by offering a few thoughts that specifically apply to Christians today. Biblicist and dispensationalist churches and believers are faced with an ever-growing challenge to contend and defend the true faith. We must accept the challenge to search the scriptures and come to a knowledge of the truth by comparing scripture with scripture. We must consistently interpret the Bible by using a literal, historical, and grammatical approach This leads to a true understanding of prophetic passages and away from the allegorical, man-conceived interpretations 
designed to support his own doctrines. I hope this study has demonstrated the difference between these two very different approaches of Bible study, especially when applied to the final events of this present church age and the age to come. Typically, Reformed Calvinist doctrine does not include a future for Israel and the Jewish people in God's prophetic plan. For this reason, they must reject the dispensational understanding of Matthew 24 and 25 because of its application to the Jewish and Gentile peoples. During the seven-year tribulation period, they'll be followed by the thousand-year messianic earthly kingdom. Rejection of the dispensational biblicist position has in some instances promote an anti-Semitic mindset based upon an incorrect Bible interpretation, which may help set the stage ultimately for the coming tribulation period. Additionally, we again see the Calvinist election doctrine as falsely portraying the God of the Bible and how he views the unsaved. Significantly, the outcome for the goats is not phrased in a parallel fashion to the outcome of the sheep, where it says for the sheep, come ye blessed, of my father. Rather, for the goats, it says, depart from me, ye cursed. Now notice carefully, it doesn't say, depart from me, ye cursed of my father. This indicates that the curse is the result of one's own choice of behavior, not determined, controlled, or elected by God the Father. As William Kelly observes, God hates putting away. I believe it is the deepest sorrow to God and throws all the onus of destruction on those whose own sin it was, those who rejected his love and his holiness and glory in rejection of his Son. Is the sheep and goat judgment part of the great white throne judgment? No, definitely not. For such a view is diametrically opposed to the Bible's teaching and once again Calvin's eschatology tumbles over. Uh, John Wilford offered a beautiful summary of this passage of Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, the sheep and the goats judgment. He writes, the answer to this problem is found in the context of this passage. Those described here are people who have lived through the great tribulation, a time of unparalleled anti-Semitism when the majority of Jews in the land will be killed. Under these circumstances, if a Gentile befriends a Jew to the extent of feeding and clothing and visiting him, it could only mean that he is a believer in Jesus Christ, recognizes the Jews as the chosen people. Accordingly, in this context, such works become a distinctive evidence that the Gentiles described as the sheep are those who are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ." End quote. I hope you found this study to be helpful as you seek to understand God's plan and purpose for history. Please send me your other questions and we'll seek the answers from God's Word, the Bible. Now until next time, may the Lord bless you mightily and I will see you either here or in the air. <laughs>